Good morning. morning. Hey, that's a good one. Happy Father's Day. Um, Welcome to Calvary Presbyterian Church. And whether you're here in person or online, uh, we're just so glad you're with us today. And as far as fathers go, I just pray an extra special blessing upon you today. That the Lord will make your day grand. And that your children will honor you in some way. We've got just a few announcements. Um, There will be a Food Finders Mobile Pantry here on Friday, August 4th. And we need volunteers. Uh, You can sign up on the welcome table out in Bigler Hall. And just a reminder to the elders to pick up their dockets for Tuesday's meeting. They're in the office right on the, uh, the ledge there by Melissa's desk. So don't forget those. And please join us for coffee hour after the uh, service today. There will not be a uh, grid class. That'll presume uh, next week. Uh, I think that's all I've got. Anybody got anything else to throw in for the good of the cause? Pardon? Oh. Okay, it's going to kick in quickly. All right. (laughs) It's Father's Day, a time to celebrate all the wonderful fathers out there not just for being shining examples of how great a dad can be, but also for being wonderful reflections of who God is. Like God, you've provided for us. You've shown us how much you care from the very beginning. With God, you've guided us, helping us navigate through every decision, big or small. You've been present sounds so simple, but it's so important, just knowing you're there when we need you. You've been patient with us, helping us to grow and learn from all the mistakes we make. And like God, you forgive us, offering us grace so those mistakes can never define us. And most of all, you've loved us unconditionally as only someone filled with God's love could. So today, we thank you, Dad, for all of this and so much more. Happy Father's Day. Anybody had a hectic week? Yes? Yeah, there's a couple. I love this time of the the service because it gives us a chance to just quiet our hearts, quiet our minds, and sit back and uh, just kind of take God's presence in. So I would ask that um, you do that. You take the time quiet time to lift up your your concerns your joys uh, to our heavenly father Lord, O most holy God. Let's let's make this a little more personal, Lord. Let's I want to go as Father. I thank you for the, the the blessing, the honor of being able to call you Father. 
I know at times we probably just take that too much for granted. But what a loving Father you are. What an awesome God you are. We just lifted up our concerns, our joys, our fears to you just a little bit ago. And I know that you've heard every one. Lord, whether it be fears of, of, of spiritual health, physical health, mental health, uh, problems with families, uh, praises with families. Um, it just, it, there's so many things that, well, everything we can bring to you. And I thank you for that. And the neat thing is, I know you answer every one, without a doubt. So, Lord, I pray a special blessing on the fathers today. Um, and, Lord, I know that uh, some of us had tremendous lives with our fathers, others maybe not so. And it may not be right now. So I ask, Lord, that if there's conflict, if there's troubles uh, amongst uh, father and, and son or father and daughter, that you will intervene. You will bring about a loving relationship. But Lord, I know it has to be in your time and your way. So give us patience and give us faith to know that you're still acting in each one of our lives. And Lord, as far as you're acting, I know that you're acting in this nation. Lord, we have so much conflict. We have so much anger amongst people that uh, you, you, no matter what you do anymore, somehow someone's offended. Um, and I ask for your I ask for your intervention, Lord, that we can once again uh, love our neighbors, love our brothers and sisters with the love that you've given us. Lord, I just pray your blessing on this day. Light us up, Lord. Holy Spirit, just pour over this, this building uh, this, uh, in this time with you. And help us to carry it outside of here. It doesn't just stop here. Lord, give us a boldness to, to, to stand up for you, to, uh, to speak for you, to speak of you, of your love and your care, and also to show it in our lives. So, Lord, we just thank you for bringing us together. And, Father, we offer to you the, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. This first song um, is one that's been around for a while, but um, it's just right out of the scripture. And so I want to read the scripture before we start singing this song. It's uh, Isaiah chapter 40, starting at verse 28 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fail. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So if you feel weary this morning, the Lord increases our strength. He is so faithful. 
Let's stand and give our offering of praise and worship to God.
Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He is. Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, Every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? He is. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? He is. He is. Church, you can be seated. And wind 
still know his name. So let go my soul and trust in him. The ways and wind still know his name. It is when words can only be formed because you have made it so. Mm. Oh, and those mountains that are in front of us, Lord, you, you cast them, you cast them to the sea. And we're not going to take our eyes off of you. We're just not going to do it. Mm. And so with our faith that we have and together we say we trust in you, eternal God, eternal Father, Abba God. Mm. We trust everything to you. It is well. It is well with my soul. And it's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, church. Kids, you are dismissed to head downstairs if you'd like to go. Wasn't the music wonderful this morning? My gosh. Thank you so much, praise team. A couple of uh, verses to read this morning, if you would. Psalm 68, 4 to 6. Let's read together, shall we? Sing to God. Sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him. His name is the Lord. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. Isn't it a great passage? Psalm 68, 1 John 3 and 1, if you would please. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for it in verbal form. We also thank you for it when it comes to us accompanied by beautiful music. And so, Lord, sometimes I think the music touches our souls more often than just the spoken word. So, what a wonderful gift that is. And we, we just pause and say, thank you for music. Thank you, Father, for those who have voices to be able to sing it out, for those who play instruments that 
lead us into your presence. We're just so thankful for that today, Lord. And I know, Father, my church family well enough to know that those songs spoke to some hearts today. For those who are going to be going through some some medical procedures, those who have health issues, those who have family issues, and uh, as we sung, oh, just if we can just keep our eyes on you, Lord, you'll get us through because you're faithful and, uh, and you are our Father, and that's where we give you thanks today. So bless, Lord, now the word of God. We ask that your spirit would take my feeble words and thoughts and as they flow out to your people, uh, whatever you need to fix, Holy Spirit, fix. As they rise up to heaven, Lord, we pray that they would be an acceptable offering once again into your heavenly place, that you might receive our praise and our worship, not only in our song, but in our minds as we wrestle with the word of God and then we figure out how to apply them to our lives. We thank you for those as well. So bless, Lord, we pray, the time before us as we listen to you speak to us through your words. We ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, please. Amen. Thank you, church. On this day that we celebrate fathers throughout our nation I thought it fitting that we actually study what is known in theology as patrology or patrology, also known as the fatherhood of God. It is seldom taught in church, by the way, where we focus on Jesus, we focus often on on the Holy Spirit, but we never take time and think about what does it mean for God to be father? What does that look like in my life? And so I thought we would take some time to think about that core doctrine because quite frankly, it's, it's a doctrine of salvation. Real quick, if God is a father, as the Bible expresses he is, then he must have what, church? If God is a father, he must have, he must have children. He must have children. And the subsequent question, therefore, is this. Well, then, how does one become a child of God so that we might be able to call him Father, which is the result and privilege of our salvation? I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, but I was, as I was putting this message together this week, I always try to find something new because I get bored with myself. And all God's people said, you don't have to say amen to that, just, just kind of nod. I get bored very easy in my theology, in how I study. I just want something new about God. I, Cindy and I, a long time ago, I was thinking about Psalm 95. Sing a new song unto the Lord. Why does God say that? Because he doesn't want us to be bored with him. Sometimes we bring old songs back like we did today and we sing them again and we go, oh, you know, that reminded me of who God was. So I don't want to be that myself. I want something new for me this week so that I'm passionate about the word of God and what God is doing in my life. And and so as I was thinking about the fatherhood of God, I began to think about you know, that really is the essence of salvation because when I think about being saved, which is a biblical word, by the way, born again, I think about when I die, I want to make sure I had got my ticket to heaven and all God's people said. <laughs> and which is a good thing, by the way. I've got a, I know a whole lot of fire escape Christians and, you know, I'm one of them. You know, I went to a revival when the preacher was really good at describing hell and guess where I didn't want to go at the end of that message and all God's people said, please, I don't want to go there, I want to go there. So how do I make that decision to make sure I have an eternal home with God? And I think if you've got a good preacher, boy, you're praying the prayer of salvation all over again because you don't want to end up being separated from God in a place of eternal damnation. You want to be with God. But I... I thought about that and I said, you know, I'm a long time removed from being afraid of God anymore. In fact, 1 John says that perfect love does something. 
It casts out fear. So now when I think about my relationship with God as my father, I'm not afraid of him. I'm not afraid of standing before God in judgment because the blood of Jesus Christ has paid for my sins and I have a right standing before him, not because of anything that I've done, but because of what Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, has done on my behalf before Father God. And so I'm thinking differently about who God, Father God is, and it just hit me this week. You know, my salvation in its core, at its essence, is the opportunity for me to call the creator of everything that exists, Papa, Abba, Father. I get the privilege of doing that because I'm saved. It's sort of the end of my salvation. So now I'm thinking, yeah, thank you that I have a home that's eternal, but that's not the blessing for me, the blessing for me is to spend every moment of eternity in the presence of Papa God, of Daddy, of my Father. That's what salvation is about. And it sort of turned me a little this week. And that's why I want to talk to you about this because I want you to understand it. Perhaps the way the Holy Spirit gave me insight this week into what it means to call God indeed Father. I do want to back up and approach the day, though, because a lot of men feel this way. For some reason, as we approach Father's Day, men have this fear of being spiritually beaten up on Sunday. And all God's men said, please. You can say amen to that one. That's a good one, because I felt that way, church. As I can remember as a young man married with two young daughters, how I hated to go to church on this Sunday. I just did. I can remember thinking, can we just skip church today and start grilling the pork producer pork chops and the burgers? And all God's men said, please, whatever you're eating, that's all right. That's what we're having. You know, I really don't feel like being reminded that I'm a failure as a dad again in church I don't need that I'm reminded of that more times than not as it is it wasn't a celebration of something good for me on that Sunday morning but a reminder of the shortcomings that I had I had as a father and as a husband that all of us as men we face because we're imperfect And especially as we look back on our life and we think how I would have done things differently with my children and how I would have reared them differently or been a different person. And you have those regrets. But, you know, as I began to get older in my faith and understanding not only my sinfulness before God but his grace and his mercy, I began to see that I was starting in the wrong place. When I came to Father's Day, I was always starting church here, I was always starting with me. That's a really bad place to start. <laughs> it, I don't want to start where the thing's broken. You know, I want to start with the, with the good model. I want to start with the new, the new addition. I want to start with that which I can aspire to and, and look to, not, not to the brokenness that I see in myself. I've mentioned this in our grid class on biblical anthropology which is the study of what the Bible says about man or mankind or humankind. Where did it start? Where was its origins? Uh, How did it move forward in its history? And I've said this, if you want to study what the Bible says about man, don't start with Adam. Start with Jesus. Start with the one who came into this world perfect and ended his life in this world perfectly. The study's not meant to point out our failures, but to align us with with the blessings that God has for us as we follow in his steps. If I want to be a man of God in my masculinity, I'm not going to start with Adam. I'm I'm going to start with Jesus. I'm going to start with what a real man looks like. That's what I'm going to study and emulate and try to model my life after. In the same way, dads, this morning, it's the same way for us as fathers. If you, wanna, if you want to understand what fatherhood is all about, don't look to Adam, 
whose firstborn son hated God and murdered his brother. So don't start with that guy. (laughs) That's a bad model. Don't look to any man in the scriptures, quite frankly. Don't look to your own father, no matter matter how good he was or bad he was, how absent he was. We need to look to God, who is our perfect father. Not so that we can point out our failures, but to rejoice in his special relationship to us and in our quest to, in fact, be like him. I will often say this to dads who are beating themselves up over what could have been or what should have been, what could have happened, what they could have done. I will remind them of this. It's a great analogy, by the way. It's two dads, and I want to point them out and then move forward. I will say this. King Saul had his Jonathan like King David had his Absalom. And if you know those stories well enough, you'll know what I'm after. King Saul, bad guy, had Jonathan, amazing man. Devoted to God, devoted friendship to David. Bad guy produced good kid. How did that happen? I don't know. King David, yeah, he did a whole lot of stuff in his life, but he was also in the scriptures known as a man who was after God's heart. David was a man after God's own heart, and he produced a kid that wanted to kill him and kick him out of his kingdom. (laughs) How does that happen? How does that happen? I don't know. Sometimes good people produce rotten fruit. Sometimes rotten fruit, rotten trees produce good fruit. I don't know how that works. By the grace of God, we're just trying. And all God's men said, please, (laughs) we're just trying. We're imperfect people trying to produce something that will honor God in our life. And the point is, we need to just look to God and then depend on the movement of the Holy Spirit to do our best. So when we look at God as Father in the Old Testament, I'm just going to take you to sort of a, an, a, a, a biblical overview from old to new. As we look at God as our Father in the Old Testament, we quick, really, quickly realize that God uses this language to communicate that he is the Father of all, but in the sense that he is Creator. He brought life to all things, and therefore he, if I can use an old King James word, he begot he, he brought forth this world that we live in. Look at a, a few passages of scripture. First of all, Isaiah 64 and 8. If you'll help me out with the yellow words, please. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all of the work of your hands. That's talking about a creative, uh, a created sense of God being our Father. It's going to be different as we move into the New Testament, by the way. So this is one of those passages where we look at and go, yes, God is our Father in this sense that he has brought forth all things, like a father brings forth children. So Isaiah is talking about that. Paul uses this type of of created fatherly language when he discusses the true God with those who worship idols in the Areacobus, which is a fancy Greek word for marketplace, in Athens, Greece. Notice this in Acts 17. If we can go to that one, Tim, please. Acts 17, 28 to 30. For in him, that is God, we live and move and have our being. And as some of your own poets, your pagan poets, pantheistic, polytheistic, multi-God worshiping poets have said we probably, we are his offspring. The we, uh, the, the his there is not referring to our God. It's probably referring to Zeus who is the, the main God of the polytheistic, pantheistic system of the Greek uh, mythology system. As some of your own poets have said, you, you get this, that God, we are his offspring. Paul's just taking common language and he's bringing it into Christianity. That's what you have to understand about this verse. 
all right? Therefore, since we are God's offspring, he's using the same language, but now he's narrowing it. He's saying, there is one true and only God, and you indeed are his offspring, but you are offspring in the creative sense of the word. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, all of these fake gods that you've been worshiping, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to, keyword, repent, which means to do what? Change your mind about God. You need to change your mind about him. This is all different, all right? One other thought comes to us from the scriptures, and that is God is the father of Israel as a people. Not only is God viewed as a father because he is the creator of all things, but in particular, he created one people group out of one man, Abraham, Avram, into this mighty nation. And we've given, we have another passage that speaks to that in Isaiah and 63, verses 15 to 16, if you'll grab the yellow as well. Look down from heaven and see from your lofty throne, holy and glorious. Where are your zeal and your might, your tenderness and your compassion are withheld from us. But church, you are our father through Abraham. Uh, Though Abraham does not know us or Israel acknowledge us, you, Lord, are our father, our redeemer from of old is your name. This is a great transition verse from Old Testament thought to New Testament relationship. The Jewish people viewed God as creator, father. You're going to find the word father in the Old Testament, but it doesn't have quite the same meaning as we move into the new, especially as Jesus sort of opens up that word for us. In other words, God birthed this nation into existence by calling out Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who ends up becoming Israel by before by the way, who, but their protection, their provision as a people did not come from a genealogical connection, but from a relationship with the living God that no other nation uniquely had. Jesus over and over got after the religious leaders about this, by the way. John 8 in particular, John 10, great passages. When they keep bringing up, but we're sons of Abraham, Jesus says, I don't care. That isn't how you get in a relationship with God. Well, we follow Moses. That's great, but that's not how this thing works. You're not understanding it. Well, we received the law. I'll bring that up, by the way. And Jesus is constantly having to go back and go, yes, but you're not understanding how this thing was supposed to work. You're not understanding the relationship side of this thing, which is another reason that Jesus left the heavens and came into this world. And in particular, if you think about John, if you think about John 14, when Jesus is telling his disciples that he's going to leave and and go to heaven to prepare a place for us, the disciples are panicking. Jesus says, you know the way. Thomas says, I don't know the way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but in and through me. And Philip asks this amazing question. Show us the, show us the Father and that will be good enough. And Jesus said, Philip, my goodness, how long do I have to hang out with you? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus came into this world so that he could unravel all of the religious, uh, unbiblical teaching and get us back to the place where we could understand from the very creation of humankind in Genesis 1 and 2 what that was supposed to look like. Do you remember that? Genesis 1 and 2, in particular, right before the fall in Genesis 3, it said that God, if we could use the word daily, in the cool of the evening, God did what with his creation? He walked in it. It was designed to be this amazing relationship with the creator God where where, when he shows up and walks within creation, man and woman 
we're supposed to have this amazing, incredible, intimate relationship with God, and sin snapped that. It broke it. And now we're in this world where we're trying to fumble and make our way and try to figure it out, and it's just too complicated. And that's why Jesus came. He came to set that thing right, give us a view of who God as Father is. I don't know if you remember this in Isaiah 9. Tim's going nuts right now because I am not even in my manuscript. I haven't been there half the time this morning. It's just words coming to me. Isaiah 9, you remember that great passage talking about Jesus coming? Uh, it's that old Messiah's Handel song. Do you remember that? Mighty Counselor, all the names. Do you remember that one little word in there? It's speaking about Jesus, by the way. Father. Father. All of these words helping us to understand what Jesus is trying to get us to so that we can understand the fatherhood of God at a much deeper and more wondrous way. There could be so much more to be said and studied about that, but I need to move us. I want us to see Jesus in the Apostle Paul here. Jesus is recorded in the Gospels as using the title Father close to 70 times, and we know that's recorded. So the assumption is what? Oh my gosh, so much more. Because he had that intense relationship with him. Jesus was trying to teach his, his personal relational connections with God so that the disciples and anyone else present during his message would understand that a family type of relationship can be had with God. Not just nationally as Israel, but something even more personal, something even more intimate with God is available to us if we could just understand this. We are called God's creation. But church, I want to point this out because it is such a misnomer. We are all God's creation, but we are not all God's children. We are all God's creation, but we are not all God's children. Children implies family relationship. That's why Paul can say to the Romans, not all Israel is Israel. Just because you claim to be a Jew doesn't mean you're a true Jew, Romans chapter 2. I want you to listen to John in 1 and 11 and 13. John chapter 1, 11 through 13. Amazing passage of scripture. I could preach on this one for a very long time and I won't. I bracketed some things so that you can see some distinction here. He, John is talking about Jesus. Jesus came to that which was his own. In other words, church, to, to the Jewish nation. Jesus came into the Jewish nation that should have been expecting him because they had the writings of Daniel that almost to the, to the day said when Jesus was supposed to arrive. Daniel chapter 9. He came into his own, his own people, his own nation. Some people say it's even his own creation and his own creation did not receive him. Verse 12. Yet to all who did do something, church, what is it? It's not highlighted, but follow. Receive. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, that is Jesus, the one who saves, he gave the right, church, Legal ability, this is a legal statement. He gave the right to those who received and believed in the name of Jesus for their salvation. He gave them the right, the legal ability, church, to become children of God. Once they were not children of God, they received, they believed, and then they became children of God. It is a legal transaction, church. We are all God's creation, but we are not all God's children. There has to be some sort of a legal movement, a legal action that takes place to bring us from creation into the family of God to the children of God, and that's what John's talking about. And then we get to what 
you've heard in my Know Your Grid class is what's called apophatic theology. It's negative theology, but it helps us to understand things in a positive light. So those who received and believed in the name of Jesus, he gave them the legal right to become the children of God. And how did that happen? In the negative. Children born, church, not of natural descent. That's the one that Jesus got after the most. I don't care if your families are, are Christians. I've said this before. It's a trick question. I give it to all my students that I teach. They always get it wrong. You surprise me today, all right? If I'm born into a Muslim house, I am a, I'm a Muslim. If I'm born into a Hindu house, I'm a Hindu. If I'm born into a Christian house, I'm a, I'm a baby. Do you see the distinct difference between world religions? Just because you're born into a family does not make you inherit their religious system as a follower of Christ. It doesn't work that way. That's not how you're born into the family of God. You're not born into the family of God because your mom and dad are Christians. That's not how this works. All right, what's the next one? Nor of human decision. This might catch you off guard a little bit, but I'll, I'll do it a little bit sarcastically, all right? So I'm, uh, I'm part of God's creation. I'm a pagan out in the world, and I get up on Monday morning, and I say, you know what? I think I'm going to be a Christian today, and there you go. I'm a Christian I decided I'm going to be it, and then that's what happened. And all God's people said, please, no, that's not how that works. That's not how that works. You don't wake up one day and decide on your own that you're going to be something. That's not how God works. The Spirit of God is what moves you and convicts you and brings you to a place where you say, oh, my goodness, I am a sinner before God a holy God, and I need saved, and I can't do this on my own. Can I get a little help here? And the father says, look to my son, and you'll be saved. That's how that works. That's two out of the three. The, the third one was a husband's will. I'll be a little sarcastic as well. All right, Saturday night, dad goes out and gets smashed. He's drunk out of his mind, kind of feels bad about it. He wakes up Sunday morning, wakes the wife and all the kids up and says, I've got an announcement to make. We're all Christians, so get your butts out of bed. We're going to church. Now, that may have happened in your house, <laughs> but that's not how it happens, is it? A dad doesn't show up on a Sunday morning and announce to his family, by the way, you're all Christians, now we're going to do what Christian people do. Not quite sure what that is, but they all held to, go to the, the building at the top of the hill called Calvary. Oh, that's not how it happens. Well, I'm a little lost, Pastor. How, how does someone enter into the family of God? Well, if it's children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, then how is someone born into the family of God? Last phrase in the text, church. It is, you are born of God. God is the one that does it. God is the one that brings the new birth into your person. He's the one that makes the transfer. He's the one that gets the legal documents around so that when you receive and believe on the name of Jesus Christ, the legal writ is, is made and you have become now the children of God. It's a fascinating passage, church. There's another passage I want us to look at. It's, it's the adoption passages. Look at, with me at Romans 8 and 14, and then we'll go to Galatians 4 and 7. For those who are led by the Spirit of God, the affirmation is, church, they are the children of God. It's how you know God is leading me. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your church adoption 
to sonship. That's that legal movement. And because of that, by him, the Holy Spirit, we now get to cry out what, church? Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. I want you to see the extra word that Paul uses in this text. He uses the the word Abba. Abba is uh, is the common language that Jesus would have spoken. It's Aramaic. He lived in a Greek culture, but he spoke Aramaic. It was the the natural language, the the common language of the time. There's a little bit of a a misunderstanding about what this word means. it, it means, there, there are those who say, well, it means that it's a word of endearment. It means papa. And it does mean that. It means daddy in common parlance, uh, colloquialism. But the, the, the word itself has a much richer meaning, by the way. It means a relationship that is very intimate with another person, with dad. But it also has a side of obedience to it. It's not just calling out father as in an intimate relationship. It's saying, I have such a deep, intimate, loving relationship with you, father, that whatever you would want me to do, I want to do that. Does that expand your definition of that a little bit? That's what that word means. That's what Paul says we we have when we come to know Jesus Christ. We have this intimate relationship with father God. The word pater is the word we find in Greek. So it is Aramaic, Abba, Abba pater. Two words, intimacy, obedience, and then the formal word of father. Look with me at Galatians 4, 4 to 7, if you would, please. But when the, time, the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, church, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are all his sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. Do you see that transfer? You were this, but because of your reception of Jesus as Lord and Savior, now you are this. You are a child of God, and since you are a child, God has made you also an heir, a co-heir of Christ. If you have an intimate, obedient relationship with Father God, you no longer are a slave, a slave to this world and its system, to your own sin. You have access to all that God, Father God has for you as a child, and I just want to say amen and amen and amen to that. I have the resources of heaven at my disposal that my father wants to give to me. Let me give you a different look at this. And I'm going to go probably quickly on this, Tim, because we're running a bit late on this because I diverted so much today. You know how I have tried to help you to understand the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are not laws. They are technically, but that's not what they're designed to be. How do I know that? Because when Jesus taught on them, he didn't teach on that that way. The, the Ten Commandments are relationship points. They tell me about who my Father is in heaven. All right? The first thing he tells me right before the Ten Commandments is, I am the Lord thy God. I have brought you out of slavery from Egypt into this. So the law doesn't start with the law. The law starts with grace. God is a gracious God. And he's gracious and he wants to bless us. So how does he do that? Thou shalt have no other God before me. What does it tell me about my father? He's jealous. He's jealous. Not in a sinful way. He's jealous over who? He's jealous over me. He doesn't want me to get distracted by non-gods, by other gods who will rob me of the intimacy that he can have with me. And I love this because I was thinking about this as well, about intimate language that would speak to this. And I went to the most intimate book in the scriptures, and it's what? 
Song of Solomon, and I, I found this passage again. I've preached a couple funeral services about this, but I was th- really thinking about this as my own funeral message. When the Shulamite woman is speaking about Solomon, her, her, new, bro- her new groom, she says this, he is mine and I am his. Isn't that beautiful language? He is mine and I am his. His And that's kind of the first point that I want to talk to you about, not using the Ten Commandments, but using that which we say every Sunday morning, which is the Lord's Prayer. So as we go through the Lord's Prayer, it's not just a check-off grocery list of the things that I have to pray for this week. That's not what that's about. The Lord's Prayer is this personal, intimate language as we go before God, just like the Ten Commandments were. And the first thing that we see is that Father, God, is, is a, it's a possessed relationship, not demonically. It's talking about the same thing as the Shulamite woman, where I get to go to God in my prayer time, and at the beginning I get to say, I am his, and he is mine. And I have this intimate, personal relationship, almost like a husband and wife. And how does the prayer start out with, church? First two words. Our Father, he's mine, and I am his. Isn't that beautiful to think through that? The other point that I want to hit personally is there's a personal proclamation for that then. Our Father, and my Father is so different than any other Father that I know on this earth because my Father is is in heaven. He is beyond anything that I could ever imagine or think. That's who my father is. He's in heaven. And you know, there's something about his name, church. It's what? Keep going through the prayer. You'll get it. It's holy. It's set apart. It's a name that I get to call him that not everyone gets to call him because we are all God's creation, but we are not all God's children. Not everybody gets to call God what I get to call him. I get to go in prayer and I get to call him only what his kids get to call him. I only get to call him Father. Isn't that beautiful? I had two daughters growing up, so my house was full of females. And I had some wonderful kids in my house that my girls had friendships with and they were there just as much as my kids were eating all my snack food and you know how that goes don't you as parents and you know they would often call us what mom and dad and it was such a privilege to be called that but at the end of the day guess what they weren't they weren't my kids I had two daughters I could have adopted all of them But at the end of the day, they weren't part of my family. They called me that, but my daughters had the privilege of calling me father because that's what I was to them. Amazing things. And I can't remember where I was heading with that. Oh, so I have this amazing father in heaven. He's got a name that only certain people can call him because of a relationship with him. This father name, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then because of the relationship that I have with him, I really want to please him. And so I pray what? Now you're thinking through the prayer, aren't you? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I want to please Dad, Abba. Abba, intimacy, obedience, Intimacy, obedience. I want to do what you want me to do, Father. I want to please you. That's the type of father I have. He's not an ogre. He's not demanding. He just loves me so much that I want to love him back. That's the father that I have. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And my father, there's something about him as well. He provides for me and he provides in two different ways. He provides in substance, in my life, because I pray to him, give us 
this day our daily bread. But not only that, but there's something greater that my father is interested in. He's not only interested in providing for me in a tangible way, but also an intangible way because he says, not only do I ask for bread, but I also ask for forgiveness. Yeah, forgive me and let me forgive other people as well. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And he's also interested in something else, protecting us from, from temptation. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us Because there's a proclamation after this that he's after with daddy. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. So when you're looking and praying through the Lord's Prayer, maybe next Sunday when we're praying through this, maybe we can can think it's not just a prayer. Maybe we can think this is how God wants me to think about him. This is how my father wants me to engage with him in a very intimate, personal way. And as a dad, that's what I want to model as well for my kids and for my grandkids. On this Father's Day, church, may we rejoice that God, the creator of everything that exists, has chosen to use the title of Father for his relationship to us. And he is a Father who communicates all that in Tales through his actions of love and mercy and grace and compassion and protection and provision and so much more that as men in a limited way we should be modeling and emulating. And there's one more slide I just want you to see. Oh, back again, Tim, if you don't mind. It'll be the one I close with. Uh, No, that's not the one. Can you go forward, please? There we go. Um, On this Father's Day, I want us to be reminded that not everyone can call God by this precious name. Be reminded that everyone who quotes the Our Father, as it's often called, is not a child of God. Only those who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, who have been legally, spiritually adopted into his family, have the privilege of calling him by his wonderful name, by his dual name, Abba, Father. And my question to you this morning is, do you have that privilege? If you do, would you say amen with me, please? Let us close in prayer, shall we? Father, thank you for allowing us to have that name to call you by by receiving and believing in the person of Jesus Christ. By his blood, we are covered. We are made right with you. And Father, we thank you that as we continue to even look at something as simple as the Lord's Prayer, that we can see glimpses of who you are as our Father. And as men here this morning, as dads, we we want to emulate that. So help us to make some changes today, Lord, to be more and more like who you are. We give you thanks, Father, for just a cursory look. There's so much more that we could study about the fatherhood of God, and if you should tarry, perhaps we'll land on that next year as well. But thank you for the initial movement into this wonderful relationship that really is the end all of our salvation, to spend eternity with our Papa, our Dad in heaven. Father, I thank you for those who are here today. I know that this year has brought some sorrow to people because there are those who have lost their dads. There are those who have lost their husbands. Uh, There are those who have lost influential men in their life who have guided them spiritually and through this this world and they have uh, left this world and so we're, we're mindful of that, Lord. So where there is grief, bring comfort. Uh, where there is uh, anxiety, Lord, bring celebration. 
on this Father's Day, we remember, we thank you for it, and the word of God that helps us to see it in a more clear way, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, please, amen. Would you stand together and let's sing a, an old hymn of the faith. Uh, Brother Grover Bishop's uh, favorite hymn as we uh, sing together, This Is My Father's World. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand the wonders wrought. This is my Father's world, the birds their carols raise, the morning light, the willy white, declare their Maker's praise. This is my Father's world, He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear Him pass, He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world, Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world, the battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be one. Father, we give you thanks for good songs, wonderful hymns that speak to you as our Father. And uh, Lord, we give you thanks on this day for the fathers represented here, for the men in our life that's made a difference for us. We pray that as we go out into our world that we would be more and more like you. As Paul said, as I follow Christ, follow me. And as I follow and desire to be a father, uh, follow me as I follow my Father in heaven. What a great uh, pattern that should be. So bless us, Lord, as we go to our, our separate ways, to family events and cookouts. May we enjoy the world that you've created, and may we, as we pray, find that privileged word in our prayers as we pray, Father in heaven. We thank you for it. We ask it in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, please. Amen. Thank you, church. God's peace to you.